We do not belong to the past dawns, but to the noons of the future. India will certainly keep her essential spirit, will keep her characteristic soul, but there is likely to be a great change in the body. Her characteristic soul Spirituality is the master key of the Indian mind. The sense of the infinite is native to it. India saw from the beginning that the physical does not get its full sense until it stands in right relation to the supra-physical. She saw that the complexity of the universe could not be explained in the present terms of man or seen by his superficial sight. That there were other powers behind. Other powers within man himself of which he is normally unaware. That he is conscious only of a small part of himself. That the invisible always surrounds the visible. The suprasensible, the sensible. Even as infinity always surrounds the finite. She saw too that man has the power of exceeding himself, of becoming himself more entirely and profoundly than he is. Paramam Veditavyam Twamasya Vishwasya Param Nidhanam Twamavyaya Shashwata Dharma Gopta Sanatanas Twam Purushomatome Twamaksharam Paramam She saw the myriad gods beyond man, God beyond the gods, and beyond God, his own ineffable eternity. She saw that there were ranges of life beyond our life, ranges of mind beyond our present mind, and above these, she saw the splendors of the spirit. Then, with that calm audacity of her intuition, which knew no fear or littleness, and shrank from no act 
whether of spiritual or intellectual, ethical or vital courage. She declared that there was none of these things which man could not attain if he trained his will and knowledge. He could conquer these ranges of mind, become the spirit, become a god, become one with God, become the ineffable Brahman. And with the logical practicality and sense of science and organized method, which distinguished her mentality, she set forth immediately to find out the way. Spirituality is indeed the master key of the Indian mind, but that was not and could not be her whole mentality. When we look at the past of India, what strikes us next is her stupendous vitality. Her inexhaustible power of life and joy of life. Her almost unimaginably prolific creativeness. For 3,000 years at least, it is indeed much longer, she has been creating abundantly and incessantly, lavishly, with an inexhaustible many-sidedness, republics and kingdoms and empires, philosophies and cosmogonies and sciences and creeds, and arts and poems and all kinds of monuments, palaces and temples and public works, communities and societies and religious orders, laws and codes and rituals, physical sciences, psychic sciences, systems of yoga, systems of politics and administration, arts, spiritual, arts, worldly, trades, industries, fine crafts, the list is endless. And in each item, there is almost a plethora of activity. She creates and creates and is not satisfied and is not tired. She will not have an end of it. Seems hardly to need a space for rest, a time for inertia and lying fallow.
She creates and creates. European critics complain that in her ancient architecture, sculpture and art, there is no reticence, no holding back of riches, no blank spaces, that she labors to fill every rift with awe, occupy every inch with plenty, Well, but defect or no, that is the necessity of her superabundance of life, of the teeming of the infinite within her. She lavishes her riches because she must. As the infinite fills every inch of space with the stirring of life and energy, because it is the infinite. All that was in India's past is still dormant. It is not destroyed. It is waiting there to assume new forms. The third power of the ancient Indian spirit was a strong intellectuality. At once austere and rich, robust and minute, powerful and delicate, massive in principle and curious in detail. Its chief impulse was that of order and arrangement, 